Welcome and thank you all for uh, attending this morning's presentation by our senior associate dean candidate, Dr. Mark Rickenbach. My name is Jed, Jed Cahoon and as the chair of the Search and Screen Committee, I have the pleasure of introducing our candidate this morning. Dr. Rickenbach is a professor and extension specialist in the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology where he also serves as department chair. His research and extension program focuses on social sciences and public policy as they relate to forests and natural ecosystems. Dr. Rickenbach earned his BS degree from Penn State, his MS degree from University of Massachusetts Amherst, and his PhD from Oregon State University. We've asked Dr. Rickenbach to address the following topic this morning. Please describe your vision for how you would like to use the opportunity to serve as senior associate dean to continue to strengthen the college generally. As one strategy, we would specifically like you to address the following scenario. In relation to the current CALS redesign, the dean has set a goal to increase faculty number by 10% by 2023. What will it take to accomplish that goal? Please outline the senior associate dean's role in that process. We've allowed 30 minutes for this presentation, which will be followed by 20 minutes of Q&A time. This presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing over the next few days. There will also be an opportunity for an open-ended feedback uh, via an online survey that will be distributed after the presentation. With that, I welcome Dr. Rickenbach. Thank you. Um, can folks hear me in the back so everything sounds great? Perfect. Thank you very much. So I really appreciate folks coming out this morning and hearing my thoughts on how I would approach the role of the Senior Associate Dean for CALS. I have at least one um, concerned member in Russell Labs. I found this in my uh, mailbox anonymously, uh, managing for dummies. So I'm not sure if that's an endorsement, but I'm going to take it as such. Um, but um, all joking aside, I don't think um, someone looks at the senior associate dean role as something someone instantly gravitates towards. I do think so that there are a set of experiences and encouragements that lead one to seriously contemplate the role. Over my time here at UW-Madison, I've had some of those experiences and probably more importantly, the encouragements of others to think about this type of role. And despite what I know to be a daunting role and that I have much to learn in fulfilling it, I am excited by the challenge to help lead the college and support the great work that we do in teaching, research, extension, outreach, and service. So in this presentation, I would like to share three things. Did it skip? No. That's because it's not on. There we go. Um, some of you know me, some of you uh, probably don't know me very well, so an introduction or a reintroduction, building on some of the things that um, Jed already shared. I'd like to uh, specifically address the charge given to me in terms of growing the college, in particular the numbers of, of faculty that we have here in CALS. And lastly, I'd like to share two final thoughts as maybe a basis for some discussion and conversation after the presentation. So I, um, I came to UW-Madison as a professor and extension specialist in 2000, and I was promoted to full in 2001. And as Jed mentioned, I do a fair amount of applied um, research and extension around public policy issues related to forests and natural resources. Um, particularly, I've worked on some legislative issues as well as some large-scale interventions to affect change of forest landowners. Um, I also had some teaching obligations in the department and have taught undergrads as well as um, graduate students. Since 2015, I have been chair of the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology. Um, for those of you who don't know much about forest and wildlife ecology, we are 21 faculty, three academic staff, and about 80 graduate students, postdocs, and research staff. We have two majors. Um, forest science and wildlife ecology that together enroll about 90 students. 
As part of being forest and wildlife ecology, I am also part of the Russell Hub community. R um, Russell Hub is the service center that provides the support for the departments of entomology, plant pathology, and forest and wildlife ecology. And so as one of the chairs, I am one of the individuals that has kind of lead oversight for the hub. And that hub serves about 500 people who work in Russell Labs. I'd like to share a little bit about some of my previous CAL service, just to give you some background on that. Um, I've been a member of APC, and during that time I was a member of the Strategic Planning Committee that um, um, first occurred when uh, Kate came here to develop a strategic plan. I then served at the CAL Strategic Planning Faculty Coordinator from 2013 to 2015 and facilitated a number of projects um, related to um, areas of governance and um, restructuring APC, ag research stations, planning and infrastructure, teaching and extension capacity, and then some other things related to the college's priority themes. And most recently, as um, chair of my department, I was also co-chair of the CALS Reorganization Design Committee that uh, put forth um, some of the things that um, the, Cal the CALS is now trying to adopt and implement. And lastly, I'm currently serving as the 2017-2018 Provost, uh, Provost Fellow. This is a new program out of the Provost Office um, to give people the opportunity to see how the Provost Office works, uh, but also then to um, do some type of service. So I've been participating with the Provost Executive Group, kind of learning about what they do and how they function. But then also I have a project that's doing a survey of chairs across campus, trying to understand kind of leadership across campus and uh, the role of chairs in providing that leadership. So I was asked to talk specifically about the last goal, um, growing the number of faculty by 10% over five years. But it's important to put that goal in the context of all the other goals that um, the dean has laid out for the college. And the other ones are to increase enrollment by 25% over the next five years, grow non-traditional and summer programs, and advance research excellence. And I think we understand as, as a college and a campus, we often see the faculty as core to achieving all of the objectives up there. So I think growing the faculty is one of the ways that we see as being able to meet these other challenges and goals that we have in front of us. So the other thing I will say is there's a lot of growth here, a lot of expectation that we're going to grow things. But we can't take, we need to understand the larger context that these occur in. And when I think about that, I return to what is our mission and our vision. So this is the college mission and vision that we adopted as part of the strategic planning process to advance and share knowledge, discover solutions, and promote opportunities in food and agriculture, bioenergy, health, the environment, and human well-being, with a vision to lead in science, innovation, and collaboration that improves life and sustains the natural world. Our goals are embedded within that. We are only going to achieve those goals if we can achieve this mission and vision. <coughs> Excuse me. So these are critically important topics that, um, to society and for our future, and we will only grow if we do these really well. So getting specifically to the task I was given, growing faculty numbers. So as a forest science undergrad, I was taught a, a thing called dynamic optimization. And so here's a basic dynamic optimization formula for faculty in time two, the future state, as a function of faculty now minus any retirements we have um, and failed retentions and any new hires that we make. So that's kind of the equation we're working with. But it's missing something, as anybody who studied this is, it's subject to a budgetary constraint. And that's one of the challenges we face right now as a college uh, is, is dealing with that budgetary constraint. The other thing I will say is we don't simply use the money that we have for faculty salaries for hiring new faculty. We need to use some of that for retention. We need to use it maybe for other salary increases that we might entertain. There are competing demands. We just don't hire faculty, we need staff. We need graduate students. 
And there's the big question about where extension dollars are headed in the future and what that's going to look like. So I'm going to come back to the, the budgetary constraint thing a little later on, but just to give folks a sense of the, the math that's at play. So this is a graphic that's available from APIR, Academic Planning and Institutional Research, about the number of faculty in CALS. And you'll note I've excluded, in the historic, I've excluded LA and Erpel since they're no longer part of us. Um, and so this is a nice graphic. It shows the rank of faculty by year, but then also the age distribution. And the darker the blue means the older the faculty that we have, which is much nicer than the graphic I gave to my faculty that showed older age faculty is red. So that was a little, a little bit disconcerting to folks. And so the darkest blue, if you can't see the, it's, maybe folks can't see it, the darkest blue is age 70 and over. The next lightest blue is age 65 to 69. And then the next lightest blue is age 60 to 64. So what's our goal? Our goal is by 2023 to have 265 faculty. About 17% or about 41 faculty are 65 or older. And so we're actually, in the next five years, gonna have the opportunity to do a fair amount of hiring just to replace folks. Now, that doesn't mean we should be, I mean, one of the things with a lot of turnover is we also lose a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge. So um, we just need to be sensitive that some of this change that's gonna happen is we're going to have a turnover in faculty in the college this is true of other institutions that are seeing this, this bump of, of older faculty who are now in a, in a place to retire. Um, but that's also an opportunity for, for us to, to hire folks. Um, so what's the role of the senior associate dean in doing that? So one of the thing is to support the recruitment and retention of excellence in our faculty. And the senior associate dean, a key role in that is assisting with startups and offers to include coordination with and advo advocacy with campus resources, whether that's the Office of the Vice Chancellor of Research and Graduate Education or the Office of the Provost. It's there to support the chairs in their negotiation. Um, how can we help chairs have a successful recruitment and hiring um, process? There's a part of this that is trying to connect things like the strategic hiring initiative or the Targets of Opportunity program. How is the college gonna participate in that? And I see that as kind of a role of, of the Senior Associate Dean to help us figure out and navigate those programs to use them to the best effect. And also asking departments some hard questions about their priorities and holding them accountable to them. One of the things is I've, I've seen is um, my department in particular, we have seen several opportunities related to um, spousal and partner accommodations. Um, how do those fit with our long-term priorities? Should we be entertaining them or should someone else be doing that? Those are some of the questions I think that the Dean's Office needs to be able to ask and, and hold people accountable to the plans that they have and some of the staffing and thinking about where opportunistic hires fit in their departments. I use the word excellent here for a reason. Uh, because of this, the pursuit of excellence in teaching, research, outreach, and diversity are inextricably linked goals. This is from our institutional statement on diversity. One of the things we face as a challenge as a college, and I know particularly in, in the programs that I work with in Forest and Wildlife Ecology, is building diversity in the college. And this is something that I think we need to be sensitive to and work hard on. Because I think in reality is our future in CALS depends on our ability to recruit students from diverse backgrounds that reflect the whole of society. If we are not able to do that, I don't think we're going to be successful in a lot of the goals and aspirations that we have. Another role for the Senior Associate Dean is to support departments in realizing their goals and maintaining productive, inclusive environments for students, postdocs, staff, and faculty. 
the college will not succeed in its goals unless departments and the other units in the college are successful. So I see the role is trying to be collaborative with departments and helping them realize they have developed five-year plans. They have new ideas for programs. How does the college help support them do that? Help support them in doing that. This can include support in planning and policy development and implementation. The other piece of that is helping them to create productive and inclusive environments. One of the things I, I had the unfortunate experience of being on the graduate faculty executive committee review team for urban and regional planning. As many of you know, that's a department because of some things that happened in it ended up on, this, on the cover of the Wisconsin State Journal because of bad things that happened in a department. Part of the role of um, the college and all department leaderships is to make sure we have environments that are available, open and inclusive for all the people who come to them. And so I think one of the things that we do through planning and through um, <coughs> helping departments is ensuring that we have those places where people feel comfortable to come to work, to learn, and to study. And lastly, there's a role to kind of coordinate activities within and beyond CALS. One of the things that I think that the Dean's Office can do is foster internal dialogue among chairs and departments and with CALS staff to ensure that departments are meeting their goals and helping the college meet theirs. And one of the things that I would emphasize in this kind of communica communicative role is trust and integrity. One of the things that I've learned during my time is, um, as a chair is that you need to be trusted at what you say and that trust matters to the people you deal with. That's really the only transactional thing we have to go on. Yes, we can move resources around but we have to do that with that people trust us and know that we're gonna honor our word and have a lot of integrity in doing that. So I wanna come back to my, my subject to uh, budgetary constraints. Because we're going to do a lot of hiring in CALS just to, the, just to replace folks who might retire. And so that's going to be very exciting. The idea that we might be able to continuously hire, that's gonna be the first time in my, since maybe the time that I was hired, that we're gonna have a fairly continuous and large number of hires coming through the college in terms of faculty. But that's maybe just replacement. What about actually growing the number? Well, we've identified some other ways to try and grow revenue. Those might be new programs, that might be through philanthropic support. But the difference between kind of retirement salary and new hires, right, there's this difference. Older people are making more money, newer people making less, is substantial, but the best we can hope for is probably a, a 1.3 or 1.2 return on that. Basically saying is, if 10 faculty retire, we might be able to hire 12 or 13, given some other uses we might have and that difference in salary. And once again, we're gonna need to use some of those dollars for some other things like retention. And then we have this problem. This is the graphic uh, showing kind of our budget change over the last four years based on the campus budget model. For those of you um, not familiar with the campus budget model, it is divided in half between research and teaching. The teaching side of the metric is driven by credit follow instructor and um, numbers of majors. And that's 80% um, of it is um, CFI. The research side is driven by expenditures and then IDC returns, equally weighted. So one of the things we are going to have to do if we want to grow the college is staunch the flow of red ink. So one of the areas we could grow is, we could say is we want to grow in, in research. So we can incentivize faculty to write more proposals and, and we should do that. But in some ways that's a hit or miss enterprise. Sometimes we score, sometimes we don't score. And those payoffs may not be evident for 12 to 18 months down the road. 
So we're going to, um, and we've received some short-term help from Central Campus to help us with that. So we could also look at the teaching side. So we've received some assistance to work on planning there too. And, but what are we doing that might have an immediate effect on our credit follow instructor? So what I'd like to share with you is just an idea. Um, and I have no expectations that this would be adopted as is. I think it's a point of discussion for thinking about how we allocate resources. I also think it's an example of how I think about problems and solutions. So to, just to give you a sense of, of, of that. And this idea could end up on the cutting room floor. But I think I, I want to share this with you just to give you a sense of how I think through these types of, of topics. Oh, by the way, that uh, over the last year, year, we lost the equivalent of seven assistant professors based on those budgetary losses. So the idea, increase TAs from the current level of 14 FTE to as many as 20 FTE relatively quickly, next year or the year after. We distribute the new TAs to high enrollment courses and those that rely on high impact practices. Um, and offer three years of pilot support. So just so we're on the same page, um, high impact practices, those are the types of practices that we as a college treasure. It's the lab experiences, it's the field experiences, it's the flipped classrooms, the things that I think make a Cal's educational experience special. So obviously, where is the money going to come from? So I think we should take it out of the pool of money that we reserve for faculty hires. This would be about one faculty line. The process for allocation should be led by the Cal's Curriculum Committee and Academic Affairs. And then what the other piece is, I'd like to treat this separately because my goal here is this could be just a short time fix to help us grow CFI in the short term. But I want to be able to create and track the relevant metrics to assess the impact. So why would I pull this approach? Why is this, do I see this as a, as a possible idea? CFI is the lowest hanging fruit in the budget model. Right, if we offer more sections, we can put more students in our classes and that's going to help our, the CFI part of the metric. Now, we could put that all in high enrollment classes but that doesn't reflect our values as a college. So we need to separate that between things that are high enrollment as well as the high impact practices. I've talked to some of my faculty and some others that say is, yes, I could, actually, I could add more sections to my classes if I had more TAs. We've had a long running conversation in this college about the allocation of RAs and TAs. I think if we want to continue to do the types of teaching we want to do, we're going to have to figure out how to do that with some more bodies, uh, particularly if we need to be able to grow programs. The other thing is, is it tests some alternative metrics. One of the things that I don't particularly like about our budget model is it simply allocates resources based on credit follow instructor and <coughs> um, the numbers of majors you have. That doesn't reflect what we value in teaching. And so if we can develop some alternative metrics that say is, yes, if we can offer more high impact practices, that has some long-term impacts on our enrollments. Like someone takes a high impact course, they come back and take more courses from us, they join our majors, that's actually going to grow our overall pot of money and hopefully put us in a position to make some of the red ink go away, grow our programs, and then also put us in a position to hire more faculty, which is our ultimate goal. 
It also creates opportunities and experiences for our graduate students. And it will also allow some time for our other initiatives to take root, like the new degree programs we're starting and some of the professional master's programs. I see this largely as a short-term fix, not permanent, unless we decide that it's working so well it should be permanent. So I'm going to finish up with some final thoughts. Um, uh, one of the things is that this was a conversation that was driven largely by a conversation around faculty numbers. But I would be remiss if I did not share something about the value of our academic and university staff. <clears throat> As a faculty member, I, I came to value and appreciate all that the, the staff that we had in our department were able to do for us. But it was really when I began as chair that I started to really understand the full importance and value of academic staff and university staff to our mission. They are kind of full partners in the endeavor that we do here. And I think it's one of the roles of the senior associate dean is to reflect that in our planning and our thinking. And that's one of the things that I have long appreciated in my time here and, and am committed to supporting. And lastly, similar to some things that I know that um, Bill Barker has said to me in, in past conversations is, CALS is a positive force for change in Wisconsin and around the world. We are a college that has had a huge impact on society and the world. We have indeed in many ways changed the world and will continue to do so. However, to do that, to make that happen and for that to continue, we also need to change. The CALS redesign process has started us down that road. We are talking about new directions, ways of working, about new partnerships across our mission, things like the global health major, conversations on the research side around big data and analytics and research not just as an intellectual domain, but also as an infrastructure question about how we support that research endeavor if, if we're gonna move seriously in that direction. And these are exciting times in the college. And there is much work left to do, and I would be honored to help move us down that road in this new role. So thank you very much, and I welcome some conversation and discussion. Hi, Mark. Well done, first off. Um, I think everything you've said is consistent with uh, how you've led our, our department in force of ecology, so I was pleased to see that. But my question is about the, uh, I think, the conflict or that tension between teaching and research. And if we're going to try to grow teaching, and the budget model is based solely on teaching or research dollars, um, as faculty, we get we get uh, uh, rewarded for research much more than we do for teaching. So how are you going to incentivize people to teach if they have to make that decision between, am I going to put my time toward research or am I going to put my time toward teaching? And I think that's one of the things I hear from some faculty that I talk to is that I could add a section to my class or I could do more research. And I think one of the things that we reward on this campus is definitely research. So that's why some of my thinking around trying to provide more TAs. I think that if we had more TAs or more teaching support in this college, we could actually take some burden off of faculty to be able to do more research um, while still increasing some of these other metrics. The other thing I... <coughs> The other thing that's really not clear in the budget process is how are we rewarded? So the budget model is like 50-50, and this is a question that chairs have long had is, how do I know my return for, if I put more money into a grant and get a grant, 
how does that actually impact the department's bottom line? And that's one of the things I think we still need to sort out to get a clearer picture about what that trade-off is. Yes, wait, hold on. <laughs> so um, uh, uh, if, if you want to grow the, the faculty by 10%, uh, how much CFI do you need to grow? Uh, yes. I think that's one of the questions, like when I said is this is an idea, that's one of the questions I would want to figure out. Like what is actually our return on investment of putting more CFI in the college? That's one of the unknowns in this proposal. Like, this is not a fully fresh proposal. This is an idea to think about and work through further to say, what would it mean if we increased enrollments by, in our classes by uh, 10%? What would that mean towards that bottom line? It may turn out that's not a good payoff. So I, I don't have a good sense of that. And I think that's one of the challenges that um, we have in trying to sort through some of that. Sure, Mark. Um, I understand the campus budget model is teaching and research, but completely void in your conversation is anything about extension. And that is an enormous part of our mission here in CALS and is a large part of our budget for a number of faculty Mm -hmm. that drives their salaries and they're bringing in research money. How do you envision um, trying to work with our associate dean for extension at, here in CALS and also our dean of extension or whatever that position might become uh, over in the division of extension uh, to ensure that we have continued funding and that extension teaching is valued the same as teaching here uh, on timetable courses? Um, I agree that is a, a serious problem, and it is one that I know that has been broached with the chancellor and others. But I think one of the things we need to do is figure out what are the right metrics for us to assess performance. I know that Doug's done a lot of work on getting us to all of, the, all of us with extension appointments to actually start reporting on a regular basis so we can start to get a sense of what that impact looks like. So I think one of the things we need to do is be able to demonstrate what is our impact as a college. Um, and right now is the only conversation right now on the money side is through the Dean of Extension. And I think that's where we need to work with them in helping them better understand what we do and the value that we bring and demonstrating that. But also I think working at a campus level to say is, you've now incorporated a whole unit that their sole mission is extension. How are we as a campus going to start to value that? What I know is there are other campuses across the country that have budget models um, that are much more draconian than ours, right? Only 10% of our budget is exposed to this budget model. There's places where it's 50% or higher, and it's all driven by responsibility-based kind of, of metrics. What you find at those places is they actually have metrics that account for things like extension. So I think one of the things we need to do is start thinking about, well, what would we propose as metrics to evaluate ourselves in extension in the applied research mission? Because one of the things is, is we need to be willing to come with some ideas about what we think are um, um, the, the right metrics for assessing that performance. And then also say how these actually connect to some of the other things like our research mission. Because particularly the extension faculty in CALS, that is a research extension synergy. And we need to demonstrate that if we weren't doing this work, we wouldn't have these research dollars. And then there's also some ancillary benefits to our teaching mission because of the various experiences that um, extension people have compared to some of the standard research and instruction faculty. What um, leverage, if any, or communication pathway is there between your potential future position and central campus, which seems to be this black box idea in terms of the budget model? I mean, what, 
to what extent can we work with central campus to change that budget model rather than always just taking what's passed down the pipe? So my understanding of that is, for a large part, is that's driven by the committees that created the budget model. So that's usually a committee approach. I think one of the things that um, we need to be able to do is demonstrate, you know, here are the metrics we think that fairly reflect what we're doing and what others are doing on campus and try to push for that type of change. So that's engaging with the budget office, um, with people in the provost's office, and really trying to kind of demonstrate why other newer metrics would make more sense. Um, but the way the governance structure here is, the original budget model came out of a governance thing, and then it kind of went to the chancellor and the vice chancellor for finance and administration. So I think there needs to be interface on the administrative side. Because right now, as I think there's a lot of concern about where money is on campus, and, and there's a, a huge emphasis on growing things um, at a campus level. And it is not clear where we hit some of these leverage points about more things being pushed down. But part of this job is ferreting out where are those, where are those connecting points, and then also kind of building the relationships to help better tell our story and our message, and propose some reasonable um, alternatives. You spoke both about participating in some of the provost's office programs that might help support hiring, and also about participating in other um, campus-wide initiatives. Could you just say a little bit more about that and where you think the opportunities are? <coughs> so one of the things I think is on some of the hiring things, I, I think that um, the provost's office is, is kind of open to new and different ideas and is willing to talk about a variety of things in the realm of faculty hiring. So would we as a college consider, consider developing some cluster hires around diversity, um, leveraging the target of opportunity funds, thus creating a cohort of diverse candidates coming into the college at one time, which is likely going to lead to their future success? So I think ideas like that are things that would require coordination across our college to be able to make that work, but then also coordinating with um, um, the provost's office to see if that's a workable thing from their perspective. Because one of the things we hear in terms of uh, uh, particularly, let's say, faculty of color is coming to Madison is difficult. Um, it can be a hard place to live and not because of the necessarily the department they're in or the, or the climate on campus or in their department, but just kind of figuring out the community of Madison and where they fit. And so one of the things you can think about is ways to structure cohorts of faculty of, of diverse backgrounds to provide a support network for them. And how do we build those support networks? If we bring in a, an, an individual in a target of opportunity hire, how do we support that individual um, by building mentors, maybe not in our college, but across campus that can help them navigate the social norms of, of our community. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate your perspective, and I'm glad you're standing up there. <laughs> um, just a question. You, you, you provided us kind of a, a bit of an insight on a proposal, you know, to maybe grow CFI internally. Do you have a, a, maybe a couple of comments uh, outside of the college, how do we how do we grow that CFI, or how do we grow interest? How do we grow, um, you know, enrollment, um, you know, in advance of, of folks coming to UW? Mm -hmm. And maybe it's not the purview of the senior associate dean. I'm not certain, but I just wonder if you've thought about that. Um, I don't think it is, but I I have thought about the topic, and I think. One of the things that departments are going to be able to do, and this is one of the reasons at the provost level I am interested in department leadership across campus is more and more is being within the purview of a department to determine. So one of the things departments are going to be able to do is be able to recruit their own undergraduate students. For a long time, that's something that was kind of a no-no. Now we're going to have more of an opportunity to have some outreach to different 
um, students. So I think that is an area where if we have the opportunity to do that, how do we do that? So I think that's, and that links into some of our connections to extensions, which has deep roots in a lot of communities. Can we leverage that to help grow the majors that are in our college? Uh, back to the uh, budget model, uh, the research uh, metric is 144 federal dollars, and it does not include the 133 non-federal research support. So we all know that that under-reports our research activity in CALS. So my question to you is, what is your argument to the uh, campus administration on uh, wh on why 133 uh, research funds should be included in the metric? Uh, I, first of all, I was surprised, as um, many of the other chairs were, that 133 overhead returns were not included in the budget model because my assumption, based on the budget model, that they were in it. And I think there are some simple things is, overhead returns are overhead returns. We either value them or we don't, and it should not be source dependent. Also, a lot of that 133 money coming back is from um, companies um, who our campus has said, this is a priority for us is to build more relationships with companies and do some more development site work. If we're not going to value their money the same way, then that says, why should we engage in those types of relationships? So I think there's a, a, a really strong case to be made that, yes, those should be included because they are just as valid forms of research. They build on some longstanding connections and also meet the goals of the campus. Um, more so than the federal dollars we get, most of these um, other sources are people that are likely going to hire our students as well. So I think, we, uh, I think there's a strong case, and it's not just a case for CALS. One of the groups that we want to look into is kind of what the College of Engineering thinks of this as well, because I'm sure they have a lot of their money in 133 support as well. I'm sorry if I'm not allowed to ask more than one question. <laughs> um, Mark, I, when I was appointed, I, I have a split. I have a formal percentage split. and. Maybe it's just hearsay, but I've heard some conversation about new faculties being, or new faculty positions being hired without any formal percentages or splits. So, I mean, and if that's not true, you can say, well, I'm not going to answer the question. Um, but I'm wondering if you've thought about, say, in the five year post tenure review process, how dynamic would you suggest a faculty person could be or, sh or should be if these? percentages in fact are dynamic in the future so I can say in the last two letters of offer that I've signed there was no formal split between research and teaching um, and I think research is always going to be a core aspect of what this campus rewards and values that that is the nature of this campus but I am one who believes that relation over the, over the arc of a career, that is a, that is a dynamic function. There are times in people's lives where they are very much research focused and some people stay research focused and others come in and fill in spaces and do more teaching. We need to value that because they're doing an important part of the mission. So I, I personally have a lot of heartburn with a system where your appointment never changes. Because I, I think that fails to A, recognize what people do in practice and also fails to recognize that career arc. Um, there are places that change those appointments every year. You know, based on now you're teaching, you're teaching this year, you're not teaching next year, that split changes. And it's, it's those places that have a much more intense kind of budget model where they're counting all of those beans. Do I think it should be like that? No, but I do think we need to recognize that change over a, a faculty career in an arc where some people stay very research intensive, others help out in other ways, and I think we need to recognize that. How would you, how would you go about identifying uh, areas for the additional faculty 
uh, recruitment? Would it be department-based, topic-based, retirement-based? I think right now the model is, and I, I think is, um, I think we're largely more department-based, but I think departments, because of the way the, um, um, the new internal allocation of the way faculty hires, like when someone retires, half the money goes back to the department, um, half of it stays with Cal. So I think giving departments discretion to set their own hiring priorities is something that came out of loud of clear the Cal's redesign, that that was a priority for them. And I think giving some departments some stake in that game actually lets them to say, here are the things we want to do as a department, and these are the faculty we need to do that. And in, if they can get additional resources to fill in that other piece of the appointment, that's, that's a positive. Um, or if they make a good argument to the Cal's deans that this fits with their priorities, then yes, I think departments are the place where our hiring should begin. I think in, in large part, our job is to facilitate that and hold departments accountable. Like you can't just say, as, well, now we want to do X, and like, well, that wasn't there three years ago, and why are we going in that direction? So I think there's part of that is, is the role of, of the dean's office, at least is how we're thinking about hiring in the short term. Mark, with growing faculty, uh, even though we have fewer faculty now than before, we have a weakened infrastructure. Um, we have buildings that need a lot of maintenance. There's health and safety issues. Uh, our ag research stations are in trouble in many cases um, with lack of resources. So, you know, if we're going to grow faculty, that means we're also going to grow the pressure mm -hmm. on uh, an aging infrastructure. So how do you propose finding the, the funding and working through that? Because how do you bring somebody on campus if there isn't a quality, you know, yep. top-notch uh, facility to work in? So I will tell you, as in all honesty, that's a part of the um, institution I am less familiar with how it works. But one of the things, so I can give you an example in my department. When I first got here in 2000, there were forest ecology and management. We occupied two floors of Russell Labs, and there were 22 faculty, and all was, you know, we all had enough space. Um, and wildlife was upstairs, and they seemed to have enough space as well. We're now, in total, a less number of faculty, and we are bursting at the seams for space. And one of the things I think we need to think about is how we actually allocate space within the college. Um, basically is we put up fences around each of the departments and each of the departments control their space. Well, what happens when departments grow or departments shrink? How do we actually first efficiently use the space we have and then maintain it? And I think one of the maintenance, in, bleh, maintenance issues is all right, that's where the research mission is really important and a lot of those IDCs are important to how we maintain that space. So I don't really have a great answer, but I think we also need to think about are we optimally using the space we have? Mark, you had indicated um, you want to increase the number of TAs in the college and I'm wondering if you've given any thought to creating a requirement of all the Cal's graduate students to TA a course at least one time before they graduate? I actually think some programs have that requirement, but that's a curricular decision within departments. I don't, I don't think the college has ever gotten involved in kind of graduate education standards. And um, I think it's something I will tell you is I think if we have TAs in classrooms, um, that's a good thing for our students. It's one of the things I think we encourage our students to have that experience, whether that should be required or not. I think that's a, that's a faculty curricular type of discussion that then has some implications about TA ships and other ways that they can engage in teaching if, if we don't have um, TA ships. Mark, since Russ set the precedent for asking a second question. Uh, we've been asking questions for about 20 minutes, and I haven't heard one person say, my life is great, keep doing what is going on. And so there's some daunting, uh, daunting tasks ahead for whoever the associate dean is, senior associate dean is with the budget and everything else. Why do you want this job? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so I'll come back to where I started the discussion, and some of it is the experiences I've had on this campus and in this college with leadership, and some of the encouragements I've received from folks. Um, I do believe the college has a bright future. There are lots of headaches. I'm one of those people, those headaches don't bother me as much as they bother some other people. And actually, if I can help fix some of those things, that to me is an achievement better than some of the other things I do. And, you know, that's, I don't know if I have a better answer than that, but these are things I'm interested in. I think about them. Um, and I believe I can help make them better. That's a great question to consider. <laughs> Thank you all for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, if there are any department chairs that would like to continue the discussion at 10 o'clock, we'll regather in this room. But thank you all again for attending.